Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this programme today, we'll be asking what is it like to run an Anglican school in the heart of Jerusalem? Warm welcome to the programme. And uh, today's guest is all the way from Jerusalem, but originally from, from England. Um, I just want to welcome you to the programme, uh, Rosemary Saunders, to the Middle East Report. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. That's an absolute pleasure. Um, can you share your, your story and your background of how you came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? How I came to faith, yes. Um, I'm the only believer in a family of five. Um, I have an unusual testimony. Um, my first husband and I, my, my first husband was an atheist and um, I um, got a job as a teacher, had two children um, and uh, we used to spend our Sunday mornings reading the Sunday Observer. Relaxing after a week's teaching, um, that was we, how we spent our Sundays. Um, so I remember getting up one Sunday morning and we opened the Sunday Observer and there was a whole p double page spread and on there was a picture of Cliff Richard. Um, I liked Cliff at the time, and uh, I thought that he was an honest person. Um, and I remember just stopping to read the article. And basically, it was his testimony. Um, and then halfway through, um, he said these words. He said, I was a millionaire, but something was missing in my life. And it wasn't a something, it was a person and that person was Jesus Christ. Now, when I look back, I, I had a fairly dark childhood and um, I won't go into any of that really, but um, I had a broken past. Um, but I had sometimes gone to Sunday school as a small child, so seeds had been sown, I knew who Jesus was. And when he said, a person, not a thing, and that's what was missing, I thought, that's odd, I feel like that. I've got a happy marriage, I've got two children, um, I've, I've got a decent job, what's wrong? Um, and I could identify with him. Anyway, at the bottom of this article in the newspaper was a little tear-off slip. It said, if you'd like to know more, fill in your name and address at the bottom and we'll send you a booklet. Well, straight away, you know, this little voice in my mind said, don't do that, you'll be on their begging list and they'll, you'll get all sorts of letters asking them for money. And it was as if this article read my mind because at the bottom in small print it said, please don't send us any money. If you do, we'll send it back. <laughs> so I, t t uh, I cut off the slip at the bottom and I posted it. And through the post came a booklet called Power for Living. Maybe some of our viewers may have come to faith through it too because I have met people who've come to faith through this booklet called Power for Living. And in it, at the start of the book, are testimonies of quite famous people who'd come to faith in the Lord. And it went through what the Christian faith was about. Um, and at the end of it, there was a prayer to say. And I have to say at that time, I was, I was pretty heavy with sin and guilt and shame. Um, I knew I was a sinner. Uh, and. Um, so I, I remember going into my bedroom. I, I felt it would be appropriate to kneel on the, on the carpet in the bedroom. So I knelt down, I held the book in front of me and I said the prayer. I got to the part in the prayer where it said, um, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Um, uh, and then I reeled off and it said, name them. <laughs> so I named these um, sins in my life, which were many. Um, and then it said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. At that point, I heard another voice speak to me and that voice said, don't do that. And I saw a picture of myself in the local town, in the marketplace with a Bible in my hand, preaching the gospel. And the voice said, that's what he'll have you do. You'll be a fool out there. You'll have no friends and this is what he'll have you do. 
So I stopped at that point. I couldn't ask him into my heart because I couldn't trust him. Um, and then I read this scripture that said, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, I will come in and eat with him and him with me. I didn't know at that time that was a scripture from Revelation. And I had this picture in my mind of him standing at the door of my life. And so this was my prayer. Lord Jesus, I want to open my heart to you. I want to open the door of my life to you, but I can't. So because of what you might make me do. So I'm going to open the door this, this far, and that's all I can do at this point. And God is gracious and merciful because he came into my life. Um, I didn't feel anything. There was no flash of lightning. There was no voice from God. There wasn't even a peace in my heart. There was nothing. I, I got up from my knees. I, I, I felt the same person. I wouldn't have said I was a Christian or anything. But a very interesting thing happened because as I started to take my dog for a walk, it was like I heard the birds for the first time. It was like the whole of creation was there before my eyes. It was like I'd never seen it. I was overwhelmed by trees and leaves and flowers. I was overwhelmed by sunsets. I was overwhelmed by the dawn. Um, life just was transformed. Uh, I suppose it, it's like he, he gave me eyes to see where I couldn't see before. I wasn't in church, um, but um, there was a little Methodist church up the road and my daughter um, wanted to join the Girl Guides. And we joined, uh, she joined the Girl Guides and this guide leader um, had an unfortunate um, opinion that anyone that's that is a teacher are just dying to work with children at the weekends. And so she thought she would ask me to be her helper. And I didn't like to say no. Um, so I helped her. I remember walking into this little Methodist chapel and as I opened the door, I clearly heard the voice of God. He said, welcome home. I walked down into this little chapel that probably had six old people and I, I don't know how I kept myself together. But after that, the Lord began to speak to me. I got into fellowship and realized, yes, I was a believer. And slowly over the years, I've known the Lord now for 33 years, I've got to know him better and better, and I love him. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your testimony. Extremely powerful. Uh, and when did the Lord place a real love for Israel and the Jewish people upon your heart? When did he place yeah. that on my heart? He placed that on my heart quite early on. I, I always say, be careful what you pray for, because uh, when I was a new teacher, I used to go to um, intercessory meetings and pray fervently that God would raise up deputy head teachers and head teachers in schools. And what did he do? He raised me up with no ambition whatsoever. I then prayed fervently for the Jewish people. Why did I pray for them? I would say that um, I'm a disciple of Derek Prince because although I was in a little chapel in a village, um, God gave me a Derek Prince tape and I just listened to just about everything Derek Prince ever taught. And, uh, and God explained, uh, Derek Prince explained to me through his teaching God's purposes for Israel. So I understood that theologically. So I had no replacement theology. I didn't come in with any religious baggage because I'd come like out of the world, in, out of darkness into light. And so that's how God taught me. So I began to pray fervently for the Jewish people um, through the ministry of Derek Prince. Amazing. I've heard so many testimonies of uh, how Derek Prince has touched so many people's lives, including my own, so right. it's, it's fantastic. Uh, and Rosemary, can you share with us your, your interesting story that, you, you know, um, that the Lord called you out of retirement after being a teacher for, yes. for so long, so many decades, and uh, you find yourself in Jerusalem. How did God call you to Jerusalem? Well, um, I'd been a head teacher in the UK for 13 years. Anyone that's watching the program who's in teaching, who's been a head teacher, will understand how much stress I've been through. <laughs> um, been through several, off several Ofsteds, um, knew what stress is like. Um, all the time that I was um, a head teacher, even though I was enjoying the job, I knew that this was my gifting. I was so looking forward to retirement. Um, and when that retirement came, the Lord before that had, was calling me um, to work with CMJ, the Church's Ministry amongst Jewish people. And um, I very quickly went up, was nominated to their council um, and I became vice chair of CMJ UK Council. 
My husband and I, we went out to Israel in 2016. Um, I was in there uh, in June 2016 and realised that the, they were having some problems at the school. But I did not want to know, okay? I'd been through being a head teacher. There's no way I was going back to that. And then when we got back, there was a call from Israel, from someone in Israel, and he said to me, Rosemary, we wondered if you'd come out and work in the school, lead the school for a year while we look for someone else. And in my heart, my first response was, absolutely no way. You must be joking. But on my lips, I said the usual Christian response, which is, I'll pray about it. Okay. I had no intentions of praying about it. No intentions at all. So, anyway, as the days wore on, I got more calls from Israel, more calls saying, would you please come? I sent them the shortest CV on record because they asked for my CV. I, gave a sh um, I sent them a CV that was half an A4, even though I'd had 25 years of experience in education, I cut it right down. I didn't want them to choose me. I knew that other people were in the mix, so choose them, not me. You know, Lord send him or her, but certainly not me. And then I got a call to say, um, the school board senior CV and would like to interview you. And this is when God really began to move in my life because I felt this was looming. I felt terror. I felt, I thought there's no way I can do this. And um, one night I was in bed, um, the interview was coming up in a few days, they wanted to interview me by Skype. Um, I lay in bed and decided silently, and this was silent, this was nothing on my lips, I was going to have it out with God. I didn't want to wake my husband up because he was asleep at the side of me. So I had this conversation with God, an argument with God, and I shouted out to God with my very being, all that I am. <laughs> And this is what I shouted into the heavenlies from my heart. I'm not going to Israel. I'm not going to Israel. And you are not going to make me right. And I shouted that out about 10 times. And then I lay back in bed on the pillow, waiting for God's reaction to what I just dared to say. And to my amazement, instead of God reprimanding me or I don't know what I expected. I thought that he wouldn't be happy with someone's response like that. But instead, I felt the warmth of the Holy Spirit envelop me. I couldn't believe the love that God was pouring upon me. And as he poured that love on me, I heard the Lord Jesus speak and remind me of a parable. He said, there was a man who had two sons. He said to the one, go. He said, yes, I'll go, but he didn't go. He said to the other son, go. He said, no, I'm not going. But later he went. I lay there on my bed. I said to Jesus, does that mean I'm like that son that said he wasn't going, but he did? He said, yes, you're just like that son. I said, does that mean I'm going? He said, yes, you'll go. And then I just fell asleep with a peace in my heart. Then, a few days later, I was interviewed on Skype for the job. And I don't open the Bible, Bible at random. I'm not one of these that open it and God speak to me. This was my normal reading. I'd, I was going through the Minor Prophets and I got on to Hosea. Hosea chapter 1 verse 11 in the New King James says these words. And the people in his, of Israel and Judah gathered together and they appointed one head. As I read that scripture, I knew God was calling me and I thought to myself, I think I'm going to get the job and I did. And that's how I finished up in Jerusalem. Excellent. So let's have a look at uh, Rosemary uh, with this very inspirational video looking at the Anglican International School in the heart of Jerusalem. Hello, I'm Rosemary Saunders. I'm the director of the Anglican International School Jerusalem. The Lord actually called me here. I had a clear call to serve him here in Jerusalem several years ago. I thought I was retired, but no, I was wrong. He called me out of retirement to come to Jerusalem and serve him here. Come with me now and see the amazing place where he called me. I'm standing outside of this amazing historic building that was built in 1896. A group of people came out from the UK 
they believed the biblical promises that God was going to reestablish the state of Israel and bring his people back. And they knew that if they were a blessing here, they would be blessed. So they came and built the building you see behind me, which at the time was a hospital. It was here to help and bless the Jewish people. Now it is a school. It is an international school. This is where we are today, right in the center of Jerusalem in an amazing spot. This is consecrated ground, an oasis of peace in a city of great tension. Our students are from 45 nationalities, 45 nationalities in this school every day. In the book of Psalms it says, you have made known to me the path of life. This is what we do with our students today. We make known to them the path of life. We talk to them about God. We talk to them about the God of Israel, the God of the Bible. And he wants them to come into this school. The problem is they don't have the money to pay the fees. We have a bursary committee, but sometimes they cannot even afford what's left over, what we can offer them. That's the need. That's where you come in. Do you want to impact a life? Are you listening today and wondering how you can impact a life for good for the Israel of tomorrow? By raising up a leader of tomorrow who has the international baccalaureate diploma, who's going to be, has that potential to be a leader. God is impacting your heart as you listen to me talk today. This is what you can do. If you want to impact a life, you can give. You can go onto our website, you can give through the button that's the giving for sponsorship, or whoever's showing you this video today, give to them, they'll send the money to us. We'll put it in our sponsorship fund. We'll be able to say to the believing community that come in when they can't afford the fees, we can help you because there's people out there that want to bless you. Maybe you're one of them. Thank you for listening to me today. So if you are watching that and you want to support the, uh, this amazing school in the heart of Jerusalem, uh, please actually contact um, Rosemary and you can see her email on screen there. Uh, Rosemary, now, Jerusalem is a, a fantastic city. Um, it's the eternal city and so much history, so much Bible prophecy um, that you can't not be moved yeah. by being in Jerusalem. But it's also a city of tension and, and a difficult city as well. So um, what are your experiences of living and working in, uh, in Jerusalem? Um, well, I spend most of my time in school. <laughs> um, kind of live and work in the... I live on the premises, I live on site. So um, most of my time is spent in school. Um, I'm in fellowship at Christ Church, which is another prem which is another ministry of CMJ. So we fellowship there, um, and it. I just want to also explain to you where the school is. Um, it's on Hanavayim Street, and Hanavayim is a Hebrew word for prophet. So it's on Prophet Street. There's actually a book written about the school. It's called A Prophetic Property. It was written by someone called Kelvin Crombie. I'm sure you've heard of Kelvin. Yeah, he's, he's been on the program. Yes. Well, he wrote the book called A Prophetic Property. Um, you can buy this book. It tells you about the history of the school, how it was first a hospital, and then it became a school. But um, also, um, you need to know that the school is in a semicircle around the school of the most orthodox Jewish community in the whole of Israel, and that's the community of Meshurim. So we're surrounded by the orthodox community, um, the very orthodox community, the ultra-orthodox. So the school's in the center of that. Um, and so it's tense. It's a tense place to be. Um, but the from w with regard to me living and kind of breathing and uh, working in the school, uh, my day starts at 7 a.m. in school every morning where there's a chapel on the school where we meet for prayer each morning. So I spend my own time in prayer before the Lord um, early, and then I go down and join the prayer meeting of the school where we bring the school soaked in prayer. We pray each day because 
at the school there are other believers that God's called from all over the world. Also some messianic believers who are uh, working in the school too. So although there's um, about 80 members of staff, probably about seven, eight, nine, ten of us join in prayer in the morning. God's not looking for a multitude. He's looking to a group, a small group really, to pray fervently to him. And that's what we do each morning. But it's tense. It's very tense living in Jerusalem. I think when we first went out there, we were warned, oh, you know, is it safe? Is it safe to go to Jerusalem? Is it ever safe to go to Jerusalem? That's why I say. Um, but while we've been there, we've heard rocket attacks, there's demonstrations, there's lots of things happening. And we survive, I survive through uh, meditating on the Word of God and on the truth. Uh, um, Rosemary, can you share with us the state the school was in uh, before you took over uh, uh, and what you've done since you've been headmistress? Um, well, um, I've set up prayer meetings for a start and I think that's transformed the school. Um, the school is full of very, very talented teachers um, from 20 nationalities. Um, and the numbers of students have grown to 320. The school's almost full. So, yes, that's uh, the, the difference. And um, can you share with us also um, the, the makeup of the students? Yes. Um, yes. And they're um, so very much of a multicultural school. Isn't yes, it, it is. Um, okay, so 45 nationalities of students. Most of these students are from parents who are working in the consulates, American Embassy, um, all sorts of organisations from all over the world that, um, that have been called in to be placed in Jerusalem. And that consists of 45 nationalities. That um, um, population of students, that body of students, is mainly quite transient. So in two or three years' time, they move on. So this year, for instance, we had 84 new students begin in August. Um, so there's this transient population. They'll, pray, they'll stay for one, two, three, four years, maximum of five, and then they move on. Then about 25% of the school is from the local population. So there's Arab Christians, Arab Muslims, Jews, and um, Messianic believers, uh, families. And also, interestingly, the Mormon universities send their children to us. So we have quite a mix. When I first started, now let me just explain to you, I don't know if I said this, I was head of a primary school. Now this is, um, the, our children are from three to 18. And so I had to teach secondary. Talk about God throwing me in the deep end. I was really thrown in the deep end and I'd never taught secondary before. But so I teach RE, religious education to secondary. So in my first RE class when I started, there were 19 children. Out of that 19, there were 10 nationalities. That's what we face every day. It's a challenge. And how has the Christian ethos of the school uh, made a real um, impact in terms of uh, academic results? Well, um, we teach the International Baccalaureate and we get very good results. But those who teach our religious education are believers. Um, and we teach the Christian faith. We teach about Judaism. We teach the basics of Islam. Um, but because you're a believer, obviously you get opportunities to share your faith. And I've had amazing opportunities to share my faith with students. I have with staff, but I have with the students. So. God has placed me there and I've had some wonderful divine encounters. I think a good thing to pray when um, you're in a school like I'm in is to ask that, is to request in prayer that you get questions asked. Um, I'm working alongside Jewish people every day um, and I've got wonderful relationships with them. But it's good to ask the Lord to get them to ask you questions and then it goes on from there. Uh, and, and your school, you describe your school as being um, uh, an oasis in, yeah. in the midst of a, a, a troubled city. Um, how is it an oasis and how are you able to bring um, Jewish and Arab children yes. together? It's an oasis. Well, um, the school has a security guard. Um, it's, uh, it's walled. It's completely secure. 
Um, but as soon as you walk in, you feel the peace. I think that's because we meet in prayer every morning and you can feel the presence of God in the school. Someone visited us recently um, from where, where we used to live in the UK. Um, we went out for dinner one evening and I said, would you like to come back to our apartment? He stepped out from the street where there's a, a gate in the wall into the school. He went, woof. <laughs> I said, are you okay? He said, wow, the difference from walking out from the pavement into your school. It was like walking through a wall. I can so feel the presence of God. That's how it is. The Lord, the, the ground that we stand on here, I believe is consecrated ground. Those first believers came out all those years ago in 1830, 40, put that stake in the ground. They believed one thing, that God was going to restore the people of Israel back to the land. That's all, just on the scriptures. Most people must have thought they were crazy, but they believed it. They went out by faith to bless the Jewish people and they built that hospital. So is it any wonder that you can feel the presence of God there? I think God is still answering their prayers of many years ago. Uh, and what impact has your school had? Because sadly, due to the uh, peace process, the Oslo Accords, there is more division now between the Israelis yes. and the Palestinian Arabs yes. than ever before because the two communities, because of terrorism, aren't able to meet and you're not having uh, Palestinians now visit Israel and working in Israel uh, and the same with Israelis. The Israelis yes. are not going to places like um, uh, Jericho and other places across uh, Judea and Samaria that they once did. Um, and there's a real separation between the two communities. How has your uh, school been able to bridge the gap between those two hatreds? Well, what I've noticed whilst being out in Israel, there are people that come that actually set up meetings for reconciliation. For instance, they'll through sport, for instance, they'll get a Jewish football team, a Palestinian football team, and they'll get them together. Um, they'll set it up, okay? Come to AISJ, you won't see anything set up. Just walk into any classroom, you'll see 45 nationalities sitting next to each other, and you'll see Arab Christians and Arab Muslims sitting next to Jewish students, friends walking around with their arms around their shoulders, real friends, not noticing the difference. So it's like reconciliation simply happens. We don't have to set it up. Okay, yeah, which is, uh, which is really interesting. So um, in terms of the education, can you describe yeah. the curriculum that uh, yes, a, a pupil can. at uh, one of your right. schools so will receive? The children come in around age three um, and we teach very much like British. We teach the national curriculum. So we'll teach the uh, foundation stage, and then we teach the British national curriculum up to age uh, of around 11. When they're going to the secondary school, we teach um, the international baccalaureate. Um, so that's through the middle years program and the, um, the IB, uh, and uh, that's how it works. But if you, get, if you get into a taxi outside school and the taxi driver says to you, oh, uh, do you work there? Yeah. I'm the director of AESJ, you can guarantee he'll say, wow, that's the best school in Jerusalem. We're known as the best school in Jerusalem. And we, yes, talented teachers, creative teachers, committed staff, and uh, students leaving with the International Baccalaureate Diploma. So how many of your, your teachers would you say are actually believers in your school? Um, I've not actually counted them. <laughs> um, probably about 10, 12. And what difference do they make? They make a huge difference. First of all, they turn up for prayer meetings in the morning. Um, I've also started a, um, a Bible study group for women. So women teachers and wives of husbands who work in school. We meet um, once a week. We go through the scriptures. We pray for each other. That's been started since I came there. Um, these believers turn up, bleary-eyed in the morning for prayer. Um, and then there are other times in the week where we pray together. Their prayers have made a difference. And what's also good about having believers there is they've not, this is not, this is no ordinary job. This is a job where they've come to Jerusalem to serve the Lord. That's why I'm there. I'm not there because I wanted to be there. I'm there because he called me. This is my mission. This is my calling. 
And very early on in the, when I first arrived, God gave me a vision that he wanted. He wanted the messianics in there. He wants to raise them up. And so that's my mission. Fabulous. And um, have you any uh, personal stories to share? Because I know we've got a video yeah. we'd like to show yeah. of a um, uh, kind of, uh, young girl um, yeah. speaking. So can you just give us a bit more of an introduction yes. into okay. uh, maybe some personal stories? Yes. Um, when I first started, um, it was uh, deep end stuff. Um, you know, I'd been out of education for six years, but it was really strange. I walked into the office and... Um, you know those little children's toys where they put these shapes in this wooden thing? <laughs> I felt like a shape, I can describe it, it was kind of like a little flower shape and I saw it in my mind and as I sat down on the chair I thought, whoops, I fit the shape. So all my life I'd been prepared for this moment. Those years of stress and strains as a head teacher had prepared me for now and Everything that had happened to me in the past was a preparation for now. I was just sharing with Jane in the car, before I get onto these stories, I was just sharing with Jane in the car when we came here. CMJ, just uh, Yeah, clarify, CMJ yeah. in the yeah. car, yeah. About, you know, the Lord speaking to us. And I was saying that when I was a new believer, I'd only known him for a couple of months, really, and I heard the audible voice of God. And uh, I was in a church in France that was empty, and I walked in and knelt down to pray and God spoke to me. He said, one day you'll love the whole world. Here I am where the logo of the school is, where the world comes to school. <laughs> Here I am with 45 nationalities that's always changing. The whole world is in AISJ. So I was called to this. So I'm not clever and ambitious or anything. He simply called me. So. When I got there and I had to lead whole staff meetings, um, whole school assemblies, um, I remember doing the whole school assembly. All these teenagers sitting there, scary. But, you know, I held, you know, I hid my nerves and I stood at the front and I talked to them and I said, well, you know, I, might have, I thought, well, I might as well say, you know, I feel God's called me here. Um, and they all just stared at me. Um, and I said, what's my job here? It's to help you to know what God's called you to. What's your life about? What's your destiny? What's God got for you? Anyway, they just sat there staring at me. Two years later, I'm sitting and I'm um, scoring a volleyball match on a sports day. A Muslim boy, about 13 years old, came and sat in front of me. He turned to me halfway through the match. He said, Mrs. Saunders, you know when you first came here, you said God has called you. Did you hear the voice of God? I said, yes. He said, how did you hear him? What did that sound like? How do you hear the voice of God? This is a Muslim boy. And he'd kept that question in his heart for two years. And then the opportunity came for him to ask me. I, get, I had a Muslim girl walk into my office one day. Mrs. Saunders, could you tell me who the Holy Spirit is? You know, these things just take you by surprise. Um, so yes, God has been impacting lives in the most amazing way. Wonderful. And um, before we show the, the clip, can you explain who this yes, uh, young okay. girl is, who is this, a pupil yeah. of your school? This young girl, um, her name is Martha. Her mother is a Russian Orthodox. They live in Jerusalem. Her father uh, is Jewish and he's very academic. Um, and he, I think part of his studies was to look at the life of Jesus. And through looking at his life, he became a believer. And he, he came through his studies of his theological um, studies and his intellectual studies to learn that Jesus is the Messiah. And so he gave his life to him. Um, so he, they're, they're living in Jerusalem. They're very hard up. They've got very little money. It's a struggle to live in Jerusalem because it is so expensive. How the locals survive, I really don't know. It's really, really expensive. So this little girl, um, her mother is Russian Orthodox. Her father is Messianic. 
and she, her mother came to me in my first year there and she said, we're going to have to take Martha out and homeschool her because we cannot afford the fees. And what happened, I went to a conference, I spoke at this conference um, and I said, is anyone, you know, is, God shown me that um, he's called me um, to help the messianic community get an education because they can't afford it. Do you know there was a lady sitting there, she said to me afterwards, she said, I had an insurance policy that matured and I thought to myself, what shall I do with this money? And she felt the Lord say, hold it, just hold that money. She says, when you got up to speak about what God's called you to do, to get the Messianics into school and help them with their school fees, I felt the Lord say to me, this is where you put your money. Excellent. And so I was able, this little girl was sponsored by a lady in Yorkshire. Amazing. Um, yes. Wonderful. So let's have a look at uh, Martha now on screen. Hello, Martha. Hello, Miss Saunders. Thanks for coming to my office today. Martha, can you tell me something about yourself? Well, I live in Israel, Jerusalem, and both my parents are tour guides, but my father is studying ancient languages. And the unique thing about it is that he's doing his MA and BA both at the same time. So he's studying really hard, and he once taught me an old song, an ancient Greek song, and it's, it, was it was found carved in a tombstone it's the oldest song on earth that is written in full and we know every single bit of it, every single word and every single note. Um, and I sang it once in an assembly and it really, I really liked it. So that's where my ambition started for ancient languages, for learning ancient languages. So I wanted to learn ancient Greek but my dad said it would be too hard, so I'm learning Latin at the moment, and I really enjoy it. And what books do you like to read? Um, what are you reading at the moment? I'm reading J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. I read The Hobbit and The Fellowship of the Rings. I'm now in The Two Towers. And I've read all the Chronicles of Narnia, and I like them just the same. And what, what are you hoping to do, you know, when you finish your AASJ? What, what do you hope to do with your life? Any ideas at this point, Martha? Well, not many, I don't really know, but maybe something connected with languages, like my father. Um, but actually, my goal for the moment is just to be a good Christian. Uh, there you go. We saw the very intelligent uh, Martha, and it's great to see that, that someone's sponsorship of sponsoring that girl has enabled to, her to have a, a wonderful education. And, um, Rosemary, um, education, it's, uh, it, it, it's the key, isn't it, to building blocks in, in terms of gaining access to many different careers, many influential jobs, um, but also pupils are also very vulnerable, I can just share from my own experience, of where you have bad teachers, they can have a very bad impression of you, and, uh, but if you have good teachers that are very, mot they motivate you, they encourage you, they give you inspiration, they can be life-changing. Um, so what are the ingredients to make up a good teacher? I think the ingredients to make up a good teacher, well, that's interesting. You have to be a good communicator, you have to, you have to and know where children are coming from and to actually care about them. It's no use going into teaching with a lot of knowledge, first of all, if you can't communicate that knowledge. I remember I failed my math soul level first time, okay? Why did I fail it? Because I had such a lousy teacher, really, who didn't encourage me. He had all the knowledge of mathematics, but he couldn't break that down so that I always think like, you get a loaf of bread and break it down into small crumbs so that I could eat it kind of thing. That's what I think about education. And so it's, it's, it's no use having all the academic knowledge if you can't break that down and understand where that person's at. We need to understand where the students are, are at. Like with mathematics, we need to know exactly where, they're at, where they are and then be able to move them on. So I think that's really important to have that, 
to be able to do that, have that skill. That's the skill of a teacher. It's no use just having the knowledge. And also to care, to be able to care for the students that you are teaching. Uh, that you're not just teaching them, you actually care. And you're a good encourager. Um, yeah, and ov obviously you've got to be committed to the profession. I think a, st a teacher needs to be very resilient because teaching today is on the front line. Lots and lots of stress and we have to keep going. I had, I had 25 years or more and I just had to keep going. There were some days when I could hardly get myself out of bed. But I had to keep going and I went through crises in my life, but I kept going. If you look back on, on my own um, journey and my own career, I had very few absences. And what does Jesus say? He said, those who endure to the end. And I think sometimes today younger people don't know what it is to endure. We're called to endure. And, you know, it's not by my own strength. We need to call upon the Lord to endure. Give me the grace to endure. Give me the faith to keep going today. And I think uh, with, with a, if a Christian teacher has those ingredients, they will be used mightily by the Lord. Yeah, very, very, very good words, mate. Uh, and um, talking about your, your, your school now, um, what impact has it had in terms of preparing, say, for example, uh, Jewish students for uh, life in the Israeli military uh, and then going on, if they then go on to some of Israel's top universities? How, how does it give them that preparation for, for life living in Israel? Well, um, it certainly helps the Messianic community. Um, the Messianic community are, are usually a community that have not got the funding. Um, but also, um, AISJ is an English-speaking school. So the Messianic community are bilingual, because if you go into the army, they're speaking Hebrew. So it, they, they're, coming to AISJ means they also speak English. We're an English-speaking school, but it does, it prepares them well. I think it certainly prepares the Messianic community because they're, it means they're balanced in their approach. They're, they're studying alongside Palestinians. They're studying alongside all other nationalities. It gives them a balanced approach. Listen, I love homeschooling. I think homeschooling's wonderful. I, I, every homeschooling student that I've met has been really, really wonderful. But there are times, I think, when we can protect our children too much. And if we put them in an environment and we smother them in prayer, I think they all come out like little what can I say, weathered, hardened plants, but still lights in a dark world. Absolutely. And um, what challenges do you face being a head teacher, knowing that we are going through incredible social change, um, where it's, uh, I think in, in the UK, it's very, very difficult to be a, a Bible-believing Christian and be a teacher um, without feeling that very threat from the authorities? Um, yes, I agree. It's much harder in the UK than it is in Israel. In, um, in our preschool, for instance, we teach the Bible. Um, in our elementary school, we teach the Bible or the Bible stories. I remember once I was covering for a primary teacher um, and uh, she said, we're just going to go through the Bible. And we're, they're just going to have a little quiz and find out all the, the books of the Bible. And there was this group of boys, and, and they were Muslims, Muslim Arabs. They said, we're not allowed to open this book. <laughs> I said, oh, really? So what are you going to do then for the rest of the lesson? Well, they grabbed those Bibles, and they went through it, and they were the most enthusiastic, uh, enthusiastic group in the whole, school, in the whole class. So, um, yeah, it's, I think so far as faith's concerned, I think so far as... Um, Christianity is concerned, it's easier in Israel than it is in the UK. I don't think the politically correct movement has kind of um, progressed quite as rapidly there. No, it's just, yeah, I can't imagine Israelis being very politically correct. <laughs> no. anyway, so it doesn't fit with the culture, thankfully. So there, there is one bastion of our Judeo-Christian heritage in the West left. Um, what is it like being in Jerusalem, particularly for your school, if there's tension in the city, if, if there's a terror attack or if there's a, a series of knifings? Because the city of Jerusalem can go into lockdown yes. when we tragically see events overtake, uh, overtake the city. 
Yeah, OK. Well, first of all, we have a policy in school where we don't discuss politics. And I think that's how it, it remains an oasis of peace. Um, because our parents want to come in and discuss politics. Um, but it's not discussed. Um, but yes, we have, um, we have security. Uh, we have bunker drills uh, several times of year where we have underground bunkers. And when anything happens, we're very well equipped to deal with it. Um, we have um, our own bus service, um, which is protected. So our, our students can be sent home quickly. So far, that hasn't happened. Um, there was a, you know, someone said to me recently, you know, do you feel safe there? Listen, there's more knife attacks in London than there is in Jerusalem. And yet there's one knife attack in Jerusalem and the whole world knows about it. Let's count how many there are in London. Yeah, they're not Absolutely. publicised, are they? Um, so basically, I feel very safe in Jerusalem and so does everyone else. But we know, we know that anything could happen at any time. But I, I don't believe it's as violent as London. It's not. <laughs> and uh, Rosemary, um, if there are any teachers watching this program, yes. and uh, I've, I've done lots of medical programs, but I haven't yes. done one on, on teaching before. So if there are any teachers watching this program today that feel inspired by what you've shared with us and uh, would love to get involved, how, how can they do so? Get involved, you mean become a teacher oh, well, or...? Yeah. Both, uh, both become a teacher or to, to maybe even come out to your own school. Okay. Uh, well, I, I would say to them, there are two professions that I think have, can have major impact upon the world, and that's the medical profession and the teaching profession. Your profession, Simon, of course, has become you know, involved in, media, in the media. But as a teacher, the number of lives that you can impact as a teacher is incredible. You know, there's, um, there used to be a little bumper sticker that there used to be in cars several years ago when teachers were complaining about their wages in this country, where it said, if you can read this, thank a teacher, okay? And I always remember that. If you can read this, thank a teacher. We're here and we are who we are today because of our teachers. Our teachers who encouraged us. The, the, it's limitless how God can use a teacher wherever in the world. Maybe God wants to call you, if you're watching this programme, to come and work at AISJ as a teacher. If, he, if so, contact me and let's have a talk about it. But not just that, anywhere in the world, a teacher can have the most tremendous impact. We have to be ready to serve the Lord wherever we are, wherever we are. And let me tell you something, if you're a teacher and you're listening to this, it's hard going. But at the end of the day, we all want to stand before God and we want to know that we answered his call. And, and I believe a teacher answering the call can have tremendous opportunities to touch lives, to actually impact lives. Amazing. And uh, Rosemary, uh, for our viewers watching who want to get behind you, who want to support your uh, Anglican International School yes. in the heart of Jerusalem, how can they do so? Well, you can help by being part of our sponsorship fund. We have some students at the moment, and I'm here on this tour by faith, wanting to raise the money for them. And you can pay into the sponsorship fund. Um, my email address um, is saundersr at aisj.co.il. You can go onto our school website, but even better still, if you're a taxpayer, if you go through CMJ UK, um, then they can get back the, what do they call it? Tax free rebate, I think. Uh, the tax rebate, what is it? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, or yeah, just contact me. Um, but be part of it. Be part of impacting a life, making a difference to a life. Making a difference to a life is the most wonderful thing that anybody can do. Maybe you're not a teacher that's watching this. Maybe you're not, and you think, what can I do? You can pray, you can give. You can give. And let me tell you this, I know this is, you know, sounds like a cliche, but it's true. You can't outgive God. What we give to the kingdom, God will give back. Uh, Rosemary, I just want to thank you so much for being uh, my guest on today's Middle East Report and uh, thank you for the incredible work you're doing, uh, being the headmistress at, at uh, the Anglican 
school in Jerusalem. Amazing story. And I uh, just want to thank you for watching this program today. Uh, there are challenges uh, being a head teacher, but to be a head teacher in an Anglican school uh, in Israel can't be easy. So please keep uh, Rosemary uh, in your prayers and support the work that she's doing. And um, we're going to leave you with this um, wonderful video produced by one of the pupils at the Anglican International School in Jerusalem that looks at the life in the year of a school.